Um, so hi there. My name is Ingrid Holm. I'm one of the investigators um, in the Baby Seek Project, which is a project that's um, a combined project at Boston Children's Hospital, Brigham and Women's Hospital, and uh, Baylor College of Medicine. So what is the Baby Seek Project? So the Baby Seek Project looks at answering the study question, should genomic sequencing be performed on newborns? So in our study, uh, we're enrolling newborns. Half the families enrolled will receive genomic sequencing, and half of them will receive standard of care. Um, families and doctors are then surveyed on their experiences, and um, uh, the infants are followed over time. And the really goals of this study are then to compare the experiences in the families that underwent sequencing compared to the families who um, uh, underwent the um, standard of care. So we are exploring the impact of genomic sequencing on, of newborns on families and providers. So there's three kind of major domains that we're looking at. So we're looking at the medical do domain, so what is the impact of sequencing on the individual and public health. We're looking at the behavioral domain, so what is the impact on physicians and pa uh, parent behavior. And we also have an aspect on looking at the economic uh, domain, so what is the impact on the health care system. So what type of results are provided to families? So as I said, we have two groups. We have the control group and the group of uh, control group, which receives standard of care, and then the sequencing group. So in the control group, we do a fairly extensive um, assessment of the family uh, tree, so we in the family history, so uh, we obtain a pedigree and a family tree, and the genetic counselor then interprets that and provides that information back to the family, so giving them some uh, ideas of the types of things that run in their families that might be relevant uh, to no their newborn baby. We also provide back the results of the standard newborn screening, which everybody has, and we go over those results, which are usually normal, um, but we go over those results with them. So in the sequencing group, we also do a family history assessment and discuss uh, the results of that with the family, as well as the standard newborn screening. But now, in addition, we have a genomic uh, report. So our genomic report is fairly extensive. It includes uh, disease-causing variants uh, associated with childhood onset disorders. We also provide information about carrier status. So these are variants that the baby may carry but needs to have two copies of the gene that are not working in order to have the disease. So it means they just are carrying one of those. Um, these are not expected to cause diseases in the infant, but may have implications for the infant as the infant gets older, as well as from other family members, as these variants likely were inherited from either one of the parents. We also provide um, what are called pharmacogenomic variants, which are variants that are in involved in the way the body metabolizes medications, and we uh, provide this information on two specific genes. Um, that affect um, uh, two specific uh, types of metabolism of medications. Um, in addition, and the babies, and particularly the babies who are in the, the uh, we have ba sick babies who are um, in, the, uh, uh, in, in, NIC in the NICU, as Dr. Uh, Kingsmore talked about, we uh, give uh, physicians the opportunity to um, reanalyze or ask us to reanalyze the sequence that we've obtained to look for genes that might be specific to the condition um, of the child, particularly children who are sick. So um, who are we enrolling? So we're enrolling healthy newborns from the well, uh, the well Newborn Nursery at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. And then we are enrolling sick newborns from the Neonatal Intensive Care Unit, which is the NICU, at the Brigham and Women's Hospital and at Children's, uh, Boston Children's Hospital. And again, these are a similar population potentially to the ones that Dr. Kingsmore was talking about. And these in particular are children who we may go back and analyze a sequence to specifically look at a condition that they're presenting with um, in the uh, Neonatal uh, Intensive Care Unit. So we have a fairly um, a rigorous uh, consent process. So we start off with an initial approach by the uh, research assistant. So this is a research assistant going in and seeing the family is interested in finding out a little bit more about our study. 
Um, if they are interested, then we have a pre-consent enrollment session that is done with, at the uh, genetic counselor. So we explore the motivations for participating. We talk about the type of results that may be returned to the uh, family. And this is a fairly extensive process, so the average time is about 60 minutes. As you can see, it varies from about half an hour to um, a little over two hours. We've developed some, we feel it's a, very important for families really to understand our project, to understand the types of information they're getting back and what the implications might be for themselves, for their baby, for other members of the family. And so we've developed some teaching aids um, to help uh, parents understand the type of results they may uh, receive. And we've done this by developing vignettes that outline possible uh, results for parents. So we give them examples of a disease that could be treated but is not preventable or cured. We give examples of a disease that could be treated and cured, disease that cannot be prevented or cured, and we do uh, give a description of carrier status. So we're hoping when families decide to enroll that they really understand um, these uh, possible results that they may return. At the end of the consenting process, we kind of give them a, a little test. We don't we would call it a test, but we do go through um, some questions to assess parents' understanding of what they've um, consented to. Um, so we have 18 questions that outline the major um, components of our study. And if there's any wrong answers, we go back and just discuss with them to clarify so that we're sure that they have a good understanding. Um, so we seem to be doing quite well with our consenting process since really most uh, the parents' average uh, score on this test is uh, 17.6 out of 18 correct, and nobody has gotten more than one uh, question wrong. So that says to us that people really do understand what they're getting into as they um, sign the consent form. Um, so we have a four, so we uh, then sign the consent form, and then we give parents a 14-day kind of window of time after consent to put, complete the baseline survey, which then finalizes their enrollment. So if parents go home and they change their mind and they decide they don't want to participate and don't um, complete the baseline survey within that period of time, then they are uh, not, uh, not enrolled in the study. So this um, outlines um, what uh, participation entails for the family. So we do our enrollment um, in the first uh, month or so of life. Um, and these are the top line is the baby's age and months. So um, they go through this enrollment process, um, the baseline survey, um, all done in the beginning before they get sequenced. Then we have a results disclosure, sh uh, disclosure session, which is an in-person session. Um, at this time, we discuss the results, uh, the family history, and go over the newborn um, uh, screening results. Um, the parents complete a post-disclosure survey, and then uh, one of us um, conducts a physical exam on the infant. We then um, do another survey at about three months post-disclosure where parents uh, complete a survey uh, from home, uh, and then we do another post-disclosure visit at about 10 months after uh, the disclosure where we discuss questions or concerns. They complete a 12-month post-disclosure survey, and we also conduct a physical exam on the infant. And I'm going to turn uh, the session now over to Megan Town, who is our genetic counselor and project manager, to talk a little bit about the family experiences. <laughs> 